Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. Well, it's been a long year for everyone, and uh, I've got a guest on today that I've wanted on the show for a long time. It's my good mate, Rob Carlton. I sort of look at this episode as an end-of-year special. So, for those of you who don't know Rob Carlton, he's been working in film and television for most of his life. He acts and writes and produces. He's won Tropfest. He's written and produced his own TV show called Shandon Pictures. He's won Logie Awards for his portrayal of Kerry Packer in the TV series Paper Giants. And he's appeared in more TV shows and more movies than you care to remember. But what I like about Rob as a mate, he probably helped me more than any other person transition from uh, my career in policing into the media. And I I owe him a lot of gratitude for that. Uh, He's talented and generous. Uh, Today, I have absolutely no idea what we're going to talk about, but I can guarantee it's going to be interesting because as good mates are, we know each other's secrets, and I'm going to make sure that Rob doesn't reveal too much. Rob, welcome to I Catch Killers. Mate, lovely to be here. Thanks for having me, Gary. It's been a long time trying to get you on this show. That's right. Um, I have very little interest in uh, talking about uh, myself in any reasonable way. Uh, well, actually, that's not true. That's a complete lie. I love talking about myself. I knew but... I'd break you down. <laughs> I, know, I, right? even, I, I have not say. even said I know, a word. I started to lie those piercing eyes of yours just cut through my soul and here I am laying myself bare. Love to talk about myself, but I do feel that we live in a world where there's so much white noise um, and I'm just conscious of not wanting to add too much to that white noise. Uh, and I've got to be honest with you, Gary, I arrive, I've, I've listened to your podcast, I know you very well, I know the world in which you inhabit, um, and there in many ways does seem to be a huge divide between the world in which I live uh, and the world in which you've operated professionally. You know, I'm yeah. not a tough guy. Um, I'm not a criminal, although I do some illegal things. <laughs> we'll um, talk about that later on. Yeah, they, do, you, do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so there was an element of that pretender yeah. um, and thinking, what, what could I offer your listener or what could I offer uh, anyone that comes to an I Catch Killers True Crime podcast that feels like a world away from um, the one in which I grew up. So, yeah, I yeah. guess that's why I was No, it, 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 makes, it makes sense. But, you know, the world that you operate in, and I, I think I call you a creative type and mm-hmm. you observe the world. Yep. And uh, we've spent a lot of time together. We've been mates for over 20 years. Yep. And uh, we also did that uh, tour around the country where we I did, got to know I, you. Which I loved. And I was really proud of uh, that tour that we did. It was really exciting and it was a great way of bringing all those stories in, interesting stories, but also, you know, bring that Barraville story back to light. And, yeah. Um, and I, I think, that's uh, that's something that uh, we really connected with because when I first met you, that was when I was in the thick of it with Barrival too, yep. and uh, the sense of uh, injustice mm. that came across from you really uh, really impressed me. Mm. But we got so much to talk about, so don't worry about feeling uh, uh, yeah uh, feeling inadequate on eye catch killers. All right. And who knows, I might get you to confess to something that uh, you haven't told us about. <laughs> Rob, first up. Before we get into uh, funny stuff, sad mm. stuff, and everything else, I just want to say, and I don't think you fully appreciate it, the impact that you had on me when uh, my life went to shit in the cops, uh, yeah. when uh, there was a real low point, when it just all happened. Mm. And I remember I was up on the Central Coast, and yeah. you said, come and have a coffee at that uh, little yeah, cafe. Like mine. It's Jimmy yeah, and Jimmy and Mel's place on the corner. Down, uh, just down the road from uh, your place. Yeah. And... It really, you sort of changed my outlook on things. And I'll, I'll just refresh what uh, what you said in case you can't remember. But basically you said you're angry and that. But, yeah, it gives, creates opportunity. There's opportunity in the media world, in journalism, that type of thing, because there was people sort of nibbling and, and trying to get me into that world. Mm. But said if you stay bitter, you have one chance of telling that story and people will listen, but then you've done it. You've got to go with a positive mindset. And just that little conversation, I don't think you fully appreciated how much it sort of changed my mindset because I was angry there. You know, I get, mm. I'm a cranky type of person mm. when things aren't going right. But that really changed my uh, changed my outlook and the way I was going to um, progress it. Wow. Okay. Um, I remember that day and I arrived um, and the reason I called you and said, let's have a coffee was because we'd had a couple of phone calls. Yeah. Uh, and the voice I heard on the end of the line on those phone calls was uh, Gary Jubelin in a different space, yeah. a space I hadn't seen or heard you in before. Um, so, you know, our relationship had always been predicated on um, 
you know, knockabout types from different sides of, you know, different, different sorts of worlds, but coming together with the same sense of joy and levity. So a lot of people see the tough guy in you. I don't see that. I've never seen that. I've seen a fun, joyous, young, childlike wonder of the world. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of hiding in the body of a, a six foot one kind of terrorizing tough guy that, that is after justice. So when I heard you on the phone, your speech patterns were different. Yeah. Um, you couldn't let certain things go and you were talking what I would describe as um, uh, reductionist cycles. So you'd, you'd, you'd stay on that one thought and you'd chew it and you'd chew it and you'd chew it and we'd start to get away from it and then you'd go back over and over and over. And I remember one of those conversations, yeah. I was in Sydney and I had to pull over at the side of the road and you were on a churn and it yeah. was like, wow. And I'd witnessed this a couple of times in other friends and to my eye, it was always the harbinger of an unwinding or an yeah. unraveling. And often this occurs when people are at the mercy of forces much greater than than an interpersonal feud. Yeah. So you are at the mercy of a structural feud where this institution that you'd given your life to had turned on you and from your perspective and from those around you inexplicably. Yeah. And you and I have a personal friend yeah. um, where we've seen this happen before. And you're witnessing a human being in free fall because the institutions and structures in which they place their trust have turned on them. And that's what I saw. That's what I heard yeah. on the phone. So when I invited you for that coffee, it was really a sense of, gosh, Gary needs to just reconnect with something here. And so as we were listening and, and you were still doing that chewing thing and it was, wow, there's a bitterness and there's an anger and I get it, yeah. but you're going to have to have faith in something other than that. And so that's, so that was just a character well, observation exercise. Yeah. I guess. Well, I, I've got to say it was good messaging because it, it certainly, I, I sort of checked myself and thought, okay, which way do I want to go? And uh, there was opportunities available and, and, and you even sold that to me. There's so many op opportunities out there, even if it was in the public speaking uh, forum, mm. I said, mm. People don't want to hear stories of broken people. People want to hear people that have been down and then come out positive. That's that, right. That type of thing. And so, yeah, it, it cha right. changed, my, uh, changed my outlook. And that thing of, and that's why stories are so important to us because I remember sitting there and it really felt like you were at the lowest of the low. Yeah. And all I was trying to do at that point was just to remind you that no human being exists in that single moment. We exist as part of the moment that came before and after. And so that's a story. Yeah. That's a sense of over time. Um, and you're right. And, and to your eternal credit, <laughs> mate, you were able to see those positives. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I know still sometimes that there's things in your guts that just give you a crunch and you don't like it and you're still angry and you'd like that revenge piece, if you will. Yeah. Like that, that, that's still an element of you. But by and large... Everything I see you do is that you push that aside and you focus on the positive and you get things done, you work really hard and you were able to give yourself that North Star. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and again, this is where I feel like something of an imposter and a charlatan. and I haven't had real tough times in my life. I, I, I think, but, and this is where you uh, underestimate yeah, your impact on, on the world and that. You, you do understand people. You understand the highs, the lows, the emotions. And I think that's, you've been what, in the acting world since... I was 14. <laughs> 14 was my first professional job and I'm 53, 52 now. So coming up to, to 40 years. And basically been doing it uh, from that time. Yeah, to, yeah. yeah. So yeah, you do get to observe people in a, in a different light and understand people. And I, I, I find that fascinating. You would have actually made a very good detective. And that's because I, I think a good detective is someone that understands human emotion, mm. uh, understands what people uh, are going through, empathy, that type of thing. And you displayed that to me in spades. So I just want to say thank you. Now we'll start attacking each other. Thanks a lot, <laughs> Gary. Thank you, um, mate. How, how we f first met. Yeah. We, our, our mate, and we can mention it, Ber Birchie, I worked with him. He was in the, in the police. And, mate, uh, Birchie was at my house yesterday fixing a door to my kitchen, dude. He is never-endingly helpful. <laughs> he is the world's busiest human being, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, he yeah, just yeah. has got to be fixing something, doing something, yeah, or yeah, helping yeah. So for the someone. listen, uh, Birchie's a mate of ours, an ex-detective, uh, an amazing guy. And, you know, he's been dedicating um, uh, so much of his time to, a ch to the charitable sector and helping young kids yeah. um, get back uh, connected with country 
yeah. uh, and working a lot with uh, young kids that have been doing it tough and bring those skills of his. He's uh, wonderful. He, he's a really good soul. And uh, I was working, I, I knew him from years gone by. We worked at some murders uh, very early in our career. And then when I went to uh, Chatsworth, he was a detective sergeant there and I came in as the crime manager. Yep. I had no idea what I was doing because I'd been in homicide all that uh, all that time and Birchie was a saviour for me there. Yep. Said, no, you've got to do this and do that. And there's, <laughs> they've got things they call computers now, Gary. Yeah. You've got to do that. Yeah. But um, so... He suggested uh, we we're all living up on the central coast, and then his good mate Angus, our, our the world's toughest guy, yep. um, a special forces guy, said, "Look, I, I train with uh, Rob and Angus. Why don't you come along?" And that's where we the friendship formed. That's right. That's right. The four most unlikely characters, the special forces, the two Ds, and an actor, <laughs> yeah. are running around the hills of Copacabana, uh, trying to get fit. Of course, fit for different reasons. I was trying to get fit just to not play the tubby best friend that uh, men with faces like me often get cast as. Um, you were staying fit to make sure the Parrish brothers didn't break your nose when you came face to face with them. Yeah. And our other friend, Special Forces, well, he was getting fit to stay alive in whatever war zone he was about to go to. So we each had different uh, motivators. But they were they were fun times. And, uh, yeah, the hills of Copacabana, I uh, <laughs> I don't forget them. Mm, they're not. Mm. They're very high and very yep. steep. Yeah, mate. And a lot of running. And of course, we'd fall in dutifully behind our uh, mate Angus, yep. who was the leader of the pack. Yeah. And sometimes you'd make some very, very stupid comments. And I want to call you on this: yep. is that when you say, "Hey, Gus, you're looking a bit chubby." Yeah. All of a sudden, his face changes, yep. and we get punished for the next hour. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It used to bring me an inordinate amount of joy <laughs> to watch an adult man get so frustrated. And, and, of course, he would inflict all sorts of terrible pain upon us. Um, but I, I, still, I still found it endlessly funny, especially to see your face when I did this, knowing what was about to come. Yeah, I, and you what, get so angry with what me. What are you fucking doing? I know, I know. What are you doing? But I loved those, uh, those training sessions. Yeah. And that was, to me, a really interesting time because I found... Um, as we were going along, and I was obviously training with you know three really interesting guys, um, and I was able to ask you a stack of questions. Yeah. And I think this is where our friendship really started blossoming, in that I was able to ask you questions about procedure, about the cases. But of course, at the heart of all of these things, I'm always interested in how you're feeling, yeah, uh, and and how you think other people are feeling and why they're doing it. Um, and as we were going for those longer runs, it was a great way for me to ask one question and then for you to just chat and answer so I could concentrate on breathing. As I'm running up yeah, the hill. as you're running yeah. up the hill. An open-ended question inviting a narrative response that's at the bottom of the hill. That's exactly yeah. right. And it was a tactic um, to keep myself uh, healthier. But also, what, what as you started um, expressing all of these things, it was an amazing chance for me to get a sense of what so many of your listeners, I think, find fascinating about the world in which you live, which is that point in time where ideas and emotions manifest themselves in the physical world. And when that action is taken, there is no coming back. Yeah. Something is broken. Yep. Someone is killed. A house is burnt down. There's consequences. Lives are changed forever. And it was that very real... Um, those very real examples that you gave me that I, I found endlessly fascinating. And I felt because I was an outsider, I wasn't a detective, I wasn't part of that world, that you were able to open up to me in a way that yeah. perhaps you couldn't open up to others. Most definitely. And I, I think um, that's part why I, I survived as long as I did in, in the cops, in that I would have those outlets where you're speaking to someone with a different perspective and it helps you because if it's just cops speaking to cops, we sort of start snowballing into the same thought pattern and, uh, yeah, you have a different perspective on, on things. And, uh, and I, I felt like it freshened me up. Like, yeah. It, it's thank you. It, it's so there's a whole, here's another conversation. Um, and it came up the other day yeah. with Angus yeah. and we were talking about, the army, uh, a mutual friend's child had say, expressed um, uh, a desire to go into, into the, the forces. Yeah. And so the father was saying to um, Angus, what would you say about a career in, in, the, in the forces? Mm. And Angus was, oh, it's terrific. We well, get to do this, you get trained, you get to do all of those things. Yeah. Wonderful. I jumped in and said, Angus, what are the arguments for not going into the forces? Yeah. And there was a real pause. 
And at that point, and the reason I asked was because all the things that he said about going to the forces was true. Yeah. But I thought that he missed the fundamental observation that every adult needs to have when their children are considering these things. Yeah. Are you prepared to be given the order to kill? Yeah. And sit in that space. Are you prepared to be given the order to kill? Are you prepared to be given the order to put your life on the line and be killed? Right. There is a fundamental difference between being a civilian and a soldier. Yeah, 100%. There's a fundamental difference between being a civilian and a police officer. Mm. Now, I am not from the, the, the softy lefty, gosh, all war is bad. This is a terrible thing. Like, of course, all war is b bad, but yeah. that doesn't mean we don't need an armed forces. That doesn't mean we don't need people to make these choices to become a soldier over a civilian. Yeah. My concern is that we aren't having the right conversations at the right times as we're contemplating these very real differences in contract of what it is to be alive. Yeah. So I'd ask you, Gary, when you were 23 and saw that guy, I remember the story of you deciding to become a copper. You were, um, you were the sparky at the time. You'd yeah. spent the day in the roof. It was hot as hell. It was lunchtime. And you see a couple of cops chasing a cook down the road and think that's for me. Yeah. That was it. Tell me, at that point in time, did you consider the notion of what it might be like to take a life, what it might be like to stand in front of a bullet, or did you discover that as you go through and realise you'd made a deal with the devil well before you understood the terms? Yeah, uh, 100%. You're naive. You go in there and you look at the exciting stuff, but you don't understand the consequences. And it was sort of brought home to me the first operation I was running where someone was uh, killed, uh, shot by police and then you realize and i remember that night i i, I went home and uh just I, I felt terrible and was that the story where you'd spoken to the sister yeah of the yeah, victim yeah and they so you were personally implicated in the death of a young man yeah and all of a sudden it was revealed to you that you were in the middle of this yeah and so let's bring it back then to other people's lives i think so much of our lives is revealed to us this way just through the experience. Through the experience, get. we suddenly come and we go. So I remember at the age of 25, suddenly becoming aware that I wasn't as honest as I could be. Yeah. I would tell little lies for the sake of love. I had a girlfriend at the time and she was this and I would not tell her the whole story because I didn't want her to be hurt or upset. Yeah. And I discovered through all of these good, what I thought were good motivations, that I perhaps wasn't the man I could be. That was a discovery of self. Now... The way one faces up to that is either through shame and we keep hiding and running or, or we, we, we try and account for it. I guess what I'm trying to figure out now is the, the revelations of the life yeah. that you chose to be a cop. I was well, I, I obviously get asked a lot, um, would you recommend policing? And, and I say yes, but it's with a, a cautionary bit at the end, I say, but understand that we'll change you. Yeah. Like you can't go into the you can't go into that world and fully commit and not be changed. Mm. So when you know this, this smiling little teenage kid, the whole world in front of him, him or her is saying, "I want to be a police officer. I want to be a police officer." And the parents are standing there proud, going, "What do you think? Should they join?" I go, "Look, it's a great, great world. There's so yeah. many opportunities, so many things that can be rewarding. But understand that we'll change you." Now, how it changes you, I, I think, comes to the individual. Is it for the better, for the worst? I don't know. I know I would be completely different if I hadn't joined the joined the cops. Yeah. I, I don't know what I would be doing. I, I, I didn't see myself in the building trade for the rest of my life, mm. but there would have been something that uh, I might have gone down. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, you, an mm. actor. Yeah. How did you get into acting at such a young age? Uh, probably girls. Um <laughs> <laughs> there was a, there was a, the Motorvale Film and TV Acting School. Oh, right. uh, we used to go on down um, after schools, mm -hmm. um, and the Thursday afternoon four thirty class. Um, there was girls over there. Uh, <laughs> so no noble reason. <laughs> no, look, it was partly that, and but also there, there's a couple of different uh, threads to it. I've always been um, like like a frog in a sock. Right. I've, I've been born with buoyancy. I was born with optimism and, and a lot of energy. I, I know that, Rob. I travelled around the country with you, drove with you sometimes. <laughs> Thank you My very much. My God, it was exhausting. <laughs> nah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, so 
I'd always been interested in in um, expression and and l- making people laugh. I always loved to make people laugh. That was always part of my go. And I was very lucky. I didn't grow up with anxiety. Yeah. Um, and so I could walk into a room and feel comfortable wherever I was, and I can uh, I can process information quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, and so with regards to acting and responding and improvising, I, I had all of these sort of latent skills. A lot of people confuse the actor for the person that wants to be looked at. Yep. For me, I, with hand on heart, I can say the reason I've been doing it for 40 years is the opposite. I like looking at people. Yeah. That's all it ever was, this extraordinary curiosity about why people are doing all that they're doing. I believe there's a gap generally between what we say, what we think, and what we do. And in say, that think, gap, do. Okay. Yep. the gap between what we say, what we think, and what we do. And that, if there's a gap between what we say and what we think, then there's a, a mask over our face. Yep. And then what we do, we say this, we do this. They're different. So there's now behavioral inconsistencies. There's masks. There's lies. There's different ways of presenting all of that. I'm fascinated in pulling back that and and seeing what those layers look like you meet someone oh my goodness me did you meet them they're amazing they're kind they're compassionate behind closed doors they may be a different thing yeah so i'm fascinated in the little cracks in the cover because they're there you can see them yeah and how often is it when we go well actually and this is the beauty of stories sometimes something happens and people say wow we never pick that but then something happens to another person and, and you look at the go, oh, well, that was always going to that person. I never, there was something about that guy. Yeah. And so for me to be an actor, whatever it was that started, got me down to the Monavale Film and Acting TV school when I was 14, it was that curiosity um, that kept me going. Because if it was all about me and being looked at, then I think yeah. that sends people crazy. And I think, you know, a lot of actors are driven by these things yeah. and they lead lonely you, you, lives you've, you've, I've, I've spoken with you about people that uh yeah you know, for all intents and purposes got everything going for them yeah uh and they, they haven't got that peace and uh happiness in their life that's right and so for me the joy of acting is this and it's really really simple your job as an actor is to recreate human behavior in front of a camera when someone yells action or on stage when the audience is present yeah. recreate human behavior and so I believe every day I wake up as an actor and I go, cool, the last thing I need to think about is how I'm feeling. Yeah. All I've got to do is go out and witness human behaviour and get really good at recreating that. Well, I, I noticed something. You stayed at my place when I was living at Piermont one time. I don't know if you remember it. And it was, it was subtle, but it was just, I'm thinking, okay, this is where, and I, I was still in the cops at the time. And yep. I'm thinking, this is where he gets it from all this energy and understanding and looking at people because you've done something. We'll talk about some of your shows and stuff that you've done and mm. identifying real quirky parts of human nature. But in the apartment I was staying at, it went over a space of about 10 days. Someone was leaving flowers and a card in the foyer. Oh, yeah. And the flowers weren't picked up. And the next day, another set of flowers had come in and the card. And it was building up. There was a pile of flowers. And, and my take on it, clearly some bloke's stuffed up here and he's yeah, trying yeah, to get yeah. his way back. As we were walking out, I remember pointing to uh, to them and I, I mentioned it to you and we're walking along. We probably only walked about 20 or 30 metres yeah. and you went back and took a photo yeah. of, of that. Yeah. And I think it was something you're just going, that's something that I could use down the what track. What a or, story, mate. Yeah. Day you, after you, you day. Could write, you could write a book out, out of that. Absolutely. Well, flower after flower, day after day, same guy, same thing, yeah. mate. What's the story sitting under that? And then you take a picture of it, it sits there and you go, wow, you can pop that into a story at some point. Yeah. But every single thing that happens everywhere, there's years leading up to that. What was that guy's relationship like with his mum, with his dad, with his sisters, yeah. with his friends? But, you know, what had he done? As you say, he's done something wrong. What's that? <laughs> what, you know, all of it? a sudden, boom. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you know, and so long as you spend a bit of time checking back in with yourself and making sure that, you, you know, you're okay and you're, you're facing up to things and, you've, you know, you're having your own epiphanies. Yeah. If you can take care of that, then waking up every day and figuring out what everyone else is up to, it's super fun, mate. There's a lot going on. Tell us about your childhood. Um, Really lucky to have have, uh, parents that um, were extraordinarily kind and loving. Um, And I don't resile from that. I I, um, I had a privileged upbringing in that my father... um, 
you know, my father was brought up with no money at all. Uh, my father, he was the first person in his family ever to go to a university, really complete high school. Mm. Um, but my father worked very, very hard um, and provided us with a life um, that was stable and loving and kind. Uh, and my father's greatest skill was picking a woman who um, I would say is the most emotionally transparent and courageous person I know. So I was brought up um, where I am able to use my guts to navigate mm. um, situations because whenever I feel that fe- butterflies in your stomach, yeah. Whenever you feel, whenever there's a discord um, in in a, in a relationship I have, because of my training at home through my mum, which is if you feel discomfort, it's really difficult to speak. It's really difficult to say something, but if you do, and you address it super quick then it goes away really quickly. Yeah. Not everyone has that training. A lot of people bottle stuff up and that's where you see explosions of character and explosions of moments. And, and I just got trained early to deal with everything as it came up. Yeah. And, and I think that allowed me to have less inner anxiety. So that allowed me to be slightly calmer in a lot of social circumstances. So man, I literally up until the age of 25 woke up every day thinking, what will the world shine upon me? Yeah. And, and I know that's really rare, yeah. but I don't say it. I don't apologize for it. I thank my lucky stars. I'm grateful for it. Um, and I don't take it for granted. They, ga- they gave your parents, in my observation, they gave you a real sense of uh, yeah, uh, doing the right thing to social justice. Yeah, look, <clears throat> um, I guess... There was always a sense of, you, you know, I mean, when my dad finished his career, he was the head of, head of the Red Cross. Yep. Um, and he, he went through politics. Too, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a really complex yep. arena um, with a father for a politician. Yep. So you grow up, and a liberal politician. Yeah. Um, and so you grow up at school getting attacked by teachers who are largely, you know, sort of labor uh, tribe. Yep. Um, and so being the son of the local politician wasn't, wasn't pleasant in any way, shape or form. Um, but I don't whinge about it because it was really water off a duck's back. Yeah. But you do get attacked, you get targeted, um, and people say a lot of really nasty, mean things. Now, the difficult part was trying to figure out, was trying to reconcile the man that I knew mm. as my father with the hideous, lying, yucky, filthy politicians that everybody talks about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so as a result, I grew up with a profound distrust of two things, journalists and politics. Because even inside the political machine, I could see these people tearing each other apart. And yet, my father seemed to be cut from a different cloth. Um, He was very well respected right across both sides of parliament. And my father was one of those people that were able to contain seemingly conflicting ideas in his body with calm. And that is what is required of our politicians. The reason so many people find political discourse so desperately frightening and so desperately, no, sorry, not frightening, frustrating and annoying. Fuck, and they're lying, they're this, they're that. Here's why, in a nutshell. 99.9% of human conversations and transactions occur with people coming together, discussing things and walking away with what they want. It's called the marketplace. And human beings are extraordinarily good at it. Now, I know the world is full of terror and horror and those things. But here in Australia, the vast bulk of our life is calm, it's ordered, it's regulated, and we largely get what we want. Yeah, That's the market. When two or more people come together and they don't get what they want through cultural reasons, social reasons, um, status reasons, historical reasons, that's where politics is. It doesn't exist anywhere else but that. That's where it needs to exist because people are coming together and they're not getting what they want. And so every time a politician comes into an argument, no one is going to get everything of what they want. Everyone is going to walk away slightly with the shits and they're all going to blame the politician. So once you know that about politics, then you've got to decide, do you have the metal to be constantly in a place where there's constant conflict? and where people aren't going to get what they want. So your people come to you for justice. Mm. You're not going to get justice through politics. And it's why people find it so frustrating. So I grew up 
as a teenager in a world where there was so many conflicting evidences of politicians being yucky and mean and my dad working tirelessly for a better outcome for all Australians. And so for years I put my head in the sand and didn't want to listen to any of it because as a 16-year-old I, I couldn't compute all of that. Yeah. It was only until really later that I started to figure it out. No, because I've I heard you, you talk about your, your father and, and not this sooner and what you just talked about there in, in glowing terms and they, it left an impression in, in your mum and the fact that, uh, yeah, they were together so long. Yeah. So I've, got a great, I've got one great story. Yep. This is a political story and mm-hmm. this is my hope. As a, a bit of a beacon of light for our current uh, yeah. guide of politicians. My father passed away in 2015. Shortly thereafter, I saw Kim Beasley at a conference. Uh, now, Kim Beasley was a great line of the Labor movement and one of the great brains mm. um, of the age. And I'm, I'm sure most listeners would attest to that. I bumped into Kim. I introduced my set, I, I, myself. I said, I'm Jim Carlton's son. Now, remembering my dad was on the liberal side of politics. And Kim looks at me and he says, ah, Rob. He says, yeah, no, I really liked your father. He was, he was, a, he was a very interesting. He says, tell me, Rob, did you know that your father and I wrote the Defence White Paper together? Now, the Defence White Paper is the governing document that has guided Australia's defence strategy for the last 30, 40 years. I said, I did not know my father wrote that with you, Kim. He said, yeah. He said, you've got to understand, there weren't too many thinkers in Canberra back in the day. I was one. Your father was the other. He said, now... It turned out we were the only two people really that had the uh, wherewithal to write this document. But we're on different sides of the house. Him liberal, me labour. So how are we going to write this thing together? He said, well, it was your father that came up with the answer. He said, Kim, it's easy. He wrote up 13 chapter headings. He said, Kim, you go away and write chapters 1, 3, 5, 7, uh, 9, 11 and 13. He went and wrote 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. We came back a month later. He said, you've got no idea how seamlessly this document fitted together. It was amazing. And then he finished it up. The only partisan crack he had was now, I don't know whether the Liberals ever used it, but it didn't really matter because we're in power for all those years. (laughs) Just had had his his dig. Yeah, but it was a lovely thing. And what I learned from my dad, is that, and he never took uh, any credit for those things. He never talked to me about those things. I never learned. Yeah, it's interesting finding it out after his Never learned about my father there. Um... But my father knew good ideas aren't owned by one person. They're lived by everyone. Yeah. And so he would share these ideas. And it wasn't a question of, here's my idea, come on, my idea ride. It was like, hey, what do you guys think about this? And then the best idea wins. And so he was a really kind of in the background guy, but understood what the main goal was. You had no desire to head into politics? No. As I said, I grew up with a profound distrust of it. Um, And it's very, very difficult to... um, It it requires... And I think, Gary, you mentioned before I'd have made a good detective. No, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. Elements of my personality would have been good at, at, at getting things done. But what I wouldn't have had is the dedication to the quiet hours and what you gave up. You gave up your personal life. I could never do that for my country. I, I know that about myself. I couldn't mm-hmm. give up my personal life to serve my country. It, it's funny because you, you, you don't make this conscious decision, but you get dragged into it. And I, I think you, you saw me, you saw me during some really busy times. Yeah. And I was just literally being dragged into this dark hole that uh, there was no return. Mate, I remember vividly when you came back, you'd left gangs and violent crime, you transferred yourself back over to homicide. And I said, what are you doing, Gary? And you said, well, there's a couple of guys out there that are so bad, no one else wants to catch them. They're killing a lot of people. I've got to get them. And that was the Parrish brothers. And I remember looking at you thinking, why on God's earth would you put yourself through that? Because there was nothing in it for you. There was nothing in it for you. But what there was in it for Australia was a couple of guys that needed to be locked up. And that yeah. was what I, that was the difference there, mate. No, I, I, I couldn't I, have offered that up. I appreciate you saying it. I, I just think where you, you sign up for policing, you, you, you sign up for it. You're not, it's not a conscript situation. You've, you've chosen that path and you, you go down it. The other thing that, uh, and yeah, it was good conversations I had with you about that job because it was in the thick of it and uh, you could uh, put a light side to it or just put perspective on it. But the Bowerville case, mm. and uh, that's another one that uh, carried, me, uh, carried me through, or uh, I carried through the career. Mm. And 
I was, because I was always fighting with people going, this is an injustice, this is an injustice. And, yeah, I, I had a lot of good people. I worked with uh, Jason Evers and Bianca and Jerry Bowden that mm. understood mm. the pain. Clearly the families understood the pain, but you felt like you're batting your head against a brick wall the whole time. Yeah. Then I, I start telling you a little bit about it or you'd done some research on it and go, yeah. this is outrageous. Yeah. That drove me too, knowing that there's people out there going, this is wrong. Yeah, mm. this has to, something has to, we, we've got to get justice for these people. So little things like that. Yeah, and again, with all of that, so this is where you start to look at the world of its characters. And yeah. the thing, again, coming back to my mum and my dad was that from a very young age, they instilled in me an understanding that we need every sort of person on the planet. We yeah. need every sort of person on the planet. My dad once said to me quite beautifully, Rob, we don't, we said, he said, we as a species still don't know all of the problems we're going to have to solve. We said we've got some very big ones on the table at the moment, things like environment um, and climate change mm. being the biggest. He said, but I truly believe if we as a species are to solve these problems that we face, then we need as many people in as many places using their imagination as possible. Mm. And what that said to me was that we need to respect each person from all walks of life. Good bad, ugly, noble, selfish, um, the zealots, the people that don't care, because at some point we're going to need each little sort of character type to come together. So in that instance, when you were doing that job on the Barrowville, which is a still an ongoing conversation, an ongoing injustice that still needs people working on it today, mm. well, that's what you did. And so at that point, there was a moment where you just needed someone to hear you and to witness that just injustice and feed it back to you so you could keep going. Yeah. But then let's have a look at the uh, the men and women from the Bowerville community and the sort of extraordinary work they've done on their own behalf. Yeah. And then you being able to witness that, then you coming along and then you supporting them in their work. Mm. And so it is this kind of multifarious groups of people that all need to be heard in order for it to all come together so that we can, I don't know, somehow get better as a people. Yeah, it, it's I, I like the uh, the holistic view of of what goes into a case like that. It's not yeah. just one person driving, and it. so it affects so many different lives. Mm. You acting, yeah. um, I love the love the story of the trop fest thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The, the trop fest, the trop fest thing. Yeah, the trop fest winner. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. It just cracked me up because it was you were telling it to me. It might have been after training one day. Just explain to people that don't understand Trop Fest. It's a short film festival, yep. a very renowned short film festival. Yeah. But there's certain rules that you have. You've got to have you submit your short film by yep. a certain date. That's right. It's got to contain something. So yep. it's, some, it's the Trop Fest signature item. Yeah. So people can't work on it for two years and then then. That's deliver. right. Tell That's us right. about uh, the way all, the way this came all about. the effort you put in to <laughs> win the Trop Fest. That's right. Well, well, look, this is an extraordinary thing. And this is uh, John Paulson's brainchild, the great John Paulson, lovely actor and an extraordinary director and a, a really interesting guy in his own right. Anyway, he set Trop Fest up. And for many, many years, it was this great thing and it kept building. Uh, people that know the story know that it started down at Tropicana um, Cafe. They took over the street there one night. X number of years later, they take it to Rush Cutters Bay. By 2006, when we're in, in, entered, it was at the Domain with 70,000 people or however many people. And it was, you know, there was prizes. You get flown to America and you win cameras and you get cash prize. It was just <laughs> over the top crazy and heaps yeah. of fun. You know, it was Sunday night. It's Australia. So everyone's getting loose <laughs> down there with their picnic rugs and their cheeses and their wines and the massive screens and it's yada 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 so it's bad. and remember of course this is the pulse john paulson so the guest judges and nicole kidman and russell crowe yeah. gabriel but all the biggest stars from samuel l jackson came out one year anyway it was just mad everyone puts in a lot to try and get this uh get get involved it's like 700 800 entries and the film's got to be seven minutes well we were going to do something. I was trying to get a TV show up at the time, which we eventually did called Shand on Pictures. Yeah. It was like, let's try and get into Trop Fest and we'll make a little bit of something with our characters from Shand on Pictures and we'll put it into Trop Fest and we'll try and shine a light on us that way. But of course, I didn't write the damn script. Uh, and then the deadline hovered and then my mate, Alex Weineris, the beautiful Alex Weineris, who I ended up um, uh, co-directing Shand on with, he rings up and says, Rob, we've got to do something. 
right? And I'm like, well, I'll you do something. I do this, this, this. And he said, well, what about that stand-up bit you do about the single father of twins choosing a favourite child? And I had twins at the time. I did this stand-up bit. And the opening line of the stand-up bit was, if I can give anyone advice uh, who has twins or, or might get twins, choose a favourite. My uh, reading suggests that the worst thing about uh, being a twin is never feeling like an individual. Favouritism fixes that. One of my boys will always know daddy loves him. But no, that's stating it too harsh, I think. Uh, there'll always be enough love to go around. Uh, there may not always be enough bicycles or private school educations. So we turned that into a short film. It was a mock documentary. We filmed it in four hours. It cost us $28. <laughs> We edited it in a day. We popped it into Tropfest. We won Tropfest. We won all the gear. We travelled overseas and we went to festivals all around the world. And it was a fun, fun thing. Uh, see how hard these actors work. Anyone <laughs> that thinks they don't put in an effort. No, that, uh, just the premise of the story just cracked me up. And if, if can you still see it online? Is that um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you Google Carmichael and Shane. Yeah. Carmichael and Shane. Uh, it's five and a half minutes. Anyone that's listening to this, Google that, have a have a watch of it, and if you're not laughing, you haven't got a sense of humour. It's, it's a, true. It's... i tell you what. So it's about a single father of twins that chooses a favourite child, and it's a beautiful exploration of, of a topic that is close to everyone's heart. <laughs> um, but when we made that, and we, we actually opened a film festival called Telluride Film Festival in America, and Apple was sponsoring that, and because we edited it on an, on an iMac, we were put a link to our film was put on the Apple homepage yeah. uh, back in the day. That was 2006. So there's only about five websites at the time. Apple was the biggest one. Millions of people saw the film. And Americans, you can imagine, they were so desperately confused and thought it was serious. <laughs> oh, this is outrageous. Yeah, How yeah, yeah. So a, a lot of people were child. calling for my children to be removed and yeah. all of these things. Well, it was sad when uh, one of the Carmichael got the bike and the other <laughs> child didn't or whatever it was. That, that was sad on Christmas oh, Day. Oh, mate, life but, isn't always easy. But, yeah, seeing those funny, funny little things. Yeah. Uh, did that open your world up? Like, I, I know when, when we first started to get together, and people might remember this uh, commercial, I, it was a, another funny thing that uh, you just stood out. You're going into a pub with a guide, uh, guide dog yeah, yeah. Uh, and no dogs allowed and it was a white fluffy dog and you pretended you were blind or That's something right. like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just a, uh, it was just a rip off of a great old joke, yeah. uh, but it was the two he's had. Um, and again, yeah, it was a really fun thing. And that was actually massive, that ad, because um, the night uh, our great Australian, Cathy Freeman, ah, uh, was won a, the yeah. 400 metres uh, and everyone knows where they were that yeah. night. And I certainly know where it was. And I certainly know that um, the ad that they went to the break on after Cathy had run, won that race was that ad. Uh, and so it was seen by six million people all at once, um, thanks to Cathy Freeman's extraordinary thing. And there I was just being the silly guy. It was a nice little gag and it was a nice little piece. But there are so many bits of um, uh, being an actor where you get to have these fun little moments, yeah. and, you know, snippets of time. Uh, and people like them and, and people like remembering them. And that's a fun thing to be part of. And uh, travelling traveling around uh, after you won that award to different festivals and that, yeah. I would imagine you'd have some fun there. Oh, it was terrific. So with Tropfest, that was an amazing opportunity. And off the back of that, the people that were sponsoring Tropfest, it was a movie network channels, and they eventually invested all their money into Shandon Pictures, which was my television series, which then, you know, turned me from an uh, yeah. uh, actor into a producer and a director and a writer. So that was a, a really fun thing. The traveling around the world with a short film um, that's five and a half minutes, right? Yeah. But it's the wackiest thing. Now, that was the same year uh, that Forrest Whitaker won um, the Academy Award for playing Idi Amin. Ah, yeah, that was a good... Uh, right. Uh, yeah, so The good. Last King of Scotland was yeah. the film. I'm sitting in... Telluride watching The Last King of Scotland before it's released to the public yeah. because it's at this very unique festival. I'm sitting there watching The Last King of Scotland and it's just extraordinary. I feel this presence sitting next to me during the thing and I'm just clapping at the end of the movie. I'm clapping, I'm clapping, and then I look next to me and Forrest Whitaker is sitting cool. next to me at the, at, at the, at the festival and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wow. I remember he won the Academy Award. I said, gee, Forrest, that's um, lovely to meet you. Yeah. Uh, well done. That's incredible, that, that performance. And he looked at me and he had big beaming smile. Now, The Last King of Scotland uh, is not a happy film. 
No, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a full-on heavy, one. Heavy so pull. I'm watching that and just admiring this man's extraordinary craft. And then he's looking at me with a completely different emotion, right? Because yeah. he made that movie years ago and he wasn't sitting through the thing. He'd arrived at the end for the Q&A. But he's just come from seeing my short film. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got, I'm sitting next to Forrest. He's got the biggest, broadest smile on his face. Gives me a hug and says, yeah. I've just seen your film. That's the funniest thing I've ever seen. So you've got two people in two completely yeah. different emotional spaces saying well done that's to a, each other. That's a classic. It was a nice one. They're, they're great little uh, little moments. <laughs> we're, uh, we're painting you as a very happy, gay, lucky person. You've had have some failings. And uh, this is... <laughs> <laughs> Where Hang on, we, how far into the, where, into the chat are we? Are we? This? Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember a time that uh, you came home. You'd been overseas. Yeah. You ca- flew in from LA. Oh, yeah. And you phoned me one afternoon. And you were, I don't know what to say, more hyper than you're normally hyper. I don't know what they gave you on the flight right. or what happened. Right. But you said, Jubes, what are you up to? I said, oh, I'm at home, Rob. It's five o'clock, six o'clock in the afternoon. I've just got back from LA. I need to train. I need, I need, I need okay. to train. I've got to wind down because I've got the rehearsal tomorrow and I'm just fully amped. I've gone, oh, well, come on. I'll come around. I said, well, uh, how, how, I've got a bike. I'll ride. And you were just <laughs> like that. You've, cu- you've come around to my place. I've opened the door. In the walks is just manic human being, yeah, full of energy. Right, right. So I need to train. What are we going to do? Go for a run, do this, do that. I go, we'll, we'll do some boxing or whatever. Yeah. And I oh, had I you remember, yeah, okay. hit, hit, hitting the pads. You go, this is good. And like any mere mortal would have collapsed by the time of what I put you through. What else can we do? I go, okay, well, there's a chin up bar. Let's do chin ups. Yeah, yeah, let's do chin ups. And I remember. And no, I remember what it was. I remember the, what the killer exercise was. So we did all of that. Yeah. We did the chin-ups. We did all of that. <laughs> and the final burnout with those push-up oh, circle twi- things. Yes. What, what, you know, yeah. the little round little things, and yeah. they twist as you do your push-up. Yeah. And it, it was those things, mate. You're blaming, blaming those? I am blaming those things. I don't know what you had taken. I'm not <laughs> saying that you'd taken anything, but... You were very hyper. That's mm-hmm. all, all I'm going to say mm. when you got there. Mm. And the next day, I think you were rehearsing for Mother and Son or something. I was, yeah. We were rehearsing for a stage play. And luckily, you got the spot because apparently you couldn't lift your <laughs> Dude, arms. It was, yeah, so that you blew my pecs out so badly. It wasn't the next day, mate. It was yeah. the next three and a half day. For the, cause I, I, was, I was subbing in. So Shane Jacobson, who's a great mate of mine. Yeah. Um, had to step away from this play because of his other commitments. I jumped in yeah. um, to work Shane, on... uh, from Kenny fame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. He's he's a play, play you should have a chat with. He's a beauty. He's classic. Um, so he'd stepped away. I had the extraordinary opportunity to work with Nolene Brown um, yeah. and Darren Gilshan and just to and, and but for the first three and a half days, I literally couldn't move my uh, my arms were flopped down beside my because any kind of attempt to raise them would shoot this pain through my pecs that I had never experienced before because of you blowing them out in that it, it was hideous and you did and I spoke to you about it and you were giggling then like you're I, giggling now I'm, I'm not proud of it Rob and I probably shouldn't have brought it up I'm a bit, bit ashamed of it you, you mentioned Shane I remember you phoned up another night and said what are you doing I said I'm at home you want to come come for a drink? I go, oh, I'm a bit busy. And then I'm here with Shane. Oh, Kenny? You're yeah. there with Kenny. I'm in. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. You're a sucker for stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, we, we had a had a had a fun night. We did. I'm just uh, I'm not getting bored with you, Rob. I'm looking at the time. We've got to, we're professional here. Yeah. We've got to make sure that we come in on uh, on time. Ooh. When we get back, we're going to have a break now. Ooh. But when we get back, we're going to talk about uh, Shandon pictures. Oh. I, I I like that. Also, I want to talk about how you get into role when you, you act, because I'll, I'll leave it as with this thought. When I was doing the live show uh, tour with you yep. around the country, and you were playing Jeffrey Hillsley, who we've talked about, a notorious pedophile, yep. but just for a portion of the show. Jeffrey Hillsley was this uh, pedophile, a terrible pedophile that I arrested for murder. We'd rehearsed, we yep. prepared for it, but then first night, Enmore Theatre, yep. full crowd, yep. I'm as nervous as nervous can be, yep. And this was fairly early in the piece. And I'm thinking, it's all right, because I've got Rob here. It, there's a crowd. Rob will, yeah, if I trip over, Rob will just walk me off stage and finish yep. the show. Part of the scene was an interview that I did with, a, a factual interview. It was from the transcripts I did with Hillsley. And I'm asking questions. 
I've, I did the interview. I know the interview. And I'm looking there, and we're sitting at the table. We've got the lights focused on That's us. That's right. And I'm interview. playing Hillsley. You're playing you. Yep. Yep. And uh, again, even with that playing me, when I was getting nervous, he said, it's not that hard, stupid. You're playing yourself. Yep. Thanks, Rob, for that <laughs> advice. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was very insightful. But you put me right off because... In the rehearsals, you, you played the role a little bit, but when we're doing it live on the first show, and I got used to it after after a while, I've asked a question, I've looked up, and I'm not seeing Rob Carlton. You had totally transferred or transformed yourself into this evil, murdering pedophile. And it just, it sort of, I had to check myself. I just, Rob, where are you? You're not the Rob. Yeah, and right. you just, you change. Is that, that a skill that comes with, comes with acting? Are you aware that you can do that? Um, I, I guess I'm aware that I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I am. Uh, and after the break, we'll go into how and why. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll be back shortly. 